My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And I would also say Ian Schrager fan, probably also 24-7, because if you listen to the last week's episode, I fanboyed. I've been saying that. I'll admit it. We talked about Studio 54. We talked about some of the early hotels that Ian created with his business partner at the time, Steve Rubell, things like the Delano, Morgan's Hotel, the Hudson, and many others. And now we're going to turn to what he's doing now because Ian, he just doesn't stop. He's been doing this for 50 years and he has two big ideas he's been working on, which are the addition hotels, which he's doing along with Marriott and the public hotels. And if you have been to some of these, and I bet some of you have, they're very cool. Um, they are of the moment. You walk in and you feel like you feel like it's just made for the moment in which we live. And I really like that. And we also talk about something that I think is really important, and that is creativity. Because there's a thing that's kind of insane about being a guy like Ian. It's like people rip you off all the time. He created this whole concept of the boutique hotel, and now people just copycat him and they think he can do it and they fail. They really fail. I mean, it's kind of like a really lousy facsimile of what he does. And he talks about the fact that creativity is disobedience. And we get into that. And I think that's really inspiring because being more creative is something that I, I try to do. I try to figure out how I can make time in my day. And Ian talks about how he makes room for creativity and also oh, he doesn't really in a structured way it's kind of interesting the way he talks about it but then this notion of creativity and disobedience i think is really it's a profound point we also do listener questions which are fun and i want to thank the listeners who wrote in with their questions now i do have one small ask and the ask is this Go check out my Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis. And the reason why is this, because occasionally when I have a guest coming on, I like to post a story saying, hey, if you have a question for this guest, please post it, please write it to me and I will ask that question. And that's what I do. But if you're not following me on Instagram, then that's not gonna happen. So go over there, follow me, send me a note, say hi. I will respond, I promise. And I will ask for questions for cool guests because we have some really good ones coming up and I want questions from you. All right, now onto the interview. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about Ian's new projects, the Edition Hotels and the Public Hotels, which are very different. Edition is very high-end, very chicy chic Public is about appealing to the youth, although anybody of any age can chill there, but still it's got more of a youthful vibe. So to start our interview, I asked Ian to tell me what exactly got him excited about each of these projects when he could be doing a million things? Why did he decide to choose these two? You know, uh, your kind of very simple explanation. I, uh, you know, was in uh, the, uh, Steve and I really did invent the boutique hotel, the lifestyle hotel. Uh, you know, uh, when we got into that, no one was doing all these things uh, predicated upon exciting food and beverage, uh, great design, uh, uh, new staff, new uniforms. I mean, to uh, give you a list of all the new things we introduced there. But what happened was, is that that thing has become ubiquitous. Uh, you know, uh, it is, to me, it's the future of the hotel business. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought that um, at this time, since I've never done anything on a really, really big scale, I think the ideas that we have contributed, and there are thousands of versions of them right now in every city of the world, and in some cities, multiple versions, but I didn't do the thousand hotels. And the, you know, that wasn't because I never cared about it. I never cared about being the biggest. I only cared about being the best. And so I thought it would be fun to do something with uh, a big hotel company that I could do a lot of these projects 
and, and, and still do them with quality and integrity and roll them out very, very fast because I haven't done anything like that before. And that's why we're doing the thing with addition. Uh, and uh, that is a luxury lifestyle hotel, and it's trying to be first in class for those kind of traditional lifestyle boutique hotels that you see proliferating all around the globe. Uh, and so I thought with what I bring to the table, what Marriott brings to the table, we each do things the other can't do, and um, let's go do this uh, really sophisticated anti-chain chain of hotels. Uh, that's all individual, all bespoke, all special, all responsive to the place that they're in, uh, and uh, nothing cookie cut, nothing taken out of a manual, everything original and creative, and let's go do that. Uh, and I think uh, so that's what we've done, and that has proved to have been very, very, very successful. Um, public, on the other hand, is probably my most important idea that I've had in the, in my my entire life. And that is because I love uh, making uh, sophisticated things, cool things, uh, great design, great ideas available, not only to rich people, but to everybody and anybody who wants it, uh, democratizing it, uh, making it accessible, uh, like the same kind of diversity I used to see on the dance floor of Studio 54, uh, old and young, rich and poor, black and white, dancing together. Nobody cared. A guy in tight jeans and no shirt on, dancing with a woman in a gown with a, a, a diamond tiara. Uh, <laughs> they didn't care about it. They were together and it created that combustible energy. And so I kind of feel that uh, luxury is changed. Uh, it, it, it's not what it was. Uh, four or five hundred years ago when all these telltale outdated ideas of luxury from Europe came over here uh, and that's what you know we used to be fascinated by the rich now we don't even like the rich uh, so everything is turned upside down uh, and so I just felt that really luxury uh, isn't about ostentatiousness and, and brands and labels it's really about having the free time to make every minute in your life count, uh, to not be hassled, uh, to not be uh, uh, um, have less time with all the new technology than you had before, because we're all obsessed with the new technology. So we're more harried, more hassled than ever we were in the history of a humankind. So I think luxury is having quality free time. And, 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 and that's what I think the public is about. It's about making it accessible, making it available to everybody else, but giving them, not dumbing it down uh, 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 like other uh, less expensive hotels are, making it just as sophisticated as the most expensive hotel on the planet, but, but making it hassle-free, giving you a quality of time to enjoy yourself. I think that's just a very, very, very important idea. And I always loved um, doing something for that really, really big, big, big market uh, of people out there, uh, but that uh, is not dumbed down or, or things taken out uh, to make it uh, uh, accessible to everyone, to make it just as sophisticated, but still accessible. And I think that's just the future, by the way. Uh, and I think uh, I don't have data to support that, but that's what I think. That's what I feel. It's the future of the hotel industry. Uh, uh, and uh, it's the future of, ever, of, of everything with cars, clothes, everything. And so that's why I'm very excited about the public idea. And I want to do a bunch of them. FOMO. FOMO. When you do a new project like that, you have a kind of a big picture concept that you've developed, which is, you know, let's make a quality luxury experience that's democratized which is it's a huge concept and then you have to then turn that then that comes into like okay we're going to design a building we're going to have these amenities we're going to have this experience we're going to have this music we're going to have this cool bar all this other stuff that you do the, the really cool club downstairs in the public all that sort of stuff how does the big idea get translated into all of these elements is it 
are you just running around observing everything you see around the world and getting ideas from other things? Are these just coming out of, out of nowhere? Like, how do you, how do you put together that set of ideas that support your overarching idea? Well, I'm curious, incurably curious about everything. I think that's a secret, uh, you know, uh, you know, and uh, when you're curious about everything, you have to see things that other people don't see in that. You have to see that that's something meaningful. Other people might pass it by and, and it doesn't kind of mean anything. Um, and so I, I make those connections. I connect those dots. Uh, with, and so I get an idea of if I extend those dots out, there's where people are going to be going. It's like, you know, you didn't have focus group to do the paper clips, black felt tip pens, cell phones, even cars. There was no focus groups. People didn't know they wanted that. But somebody connects the dots. Somebody puts it together and say, this is what I think people need. They don't know it yet. But I think pe people need that. And that's the way I go about doing it. And then in the execution of it, you have to avoid the cliches. Like, you can't have a hotel in London and have a doorman in a red military suit, the black furry hat standing <laughs> outside. You know, uh, you, you, you have to jettison that away. So like we did public, and it is for young at heart people, but it's not only for young people. Uh, and uh, so how did we do that? Well, we used modest finishes, plywood, concrete, raw steel, things like that, but use them in sophisticated ways that resonates with people because it doesn't feel contrived. It doesn't feel like we're making much of an effort. It's effortless. Uh, and uh, you have to have that kind of touch that when it all comes together, uh, it really is the total is more than the sum of the individual parts. And that's the alchemy. That's the magic. That's the magic that Disney had. That's the magic that Steve Jobs had. That's the magic that every creative person has. It, what, what they invent and what they create is more than the individual elements. It's almost like cooking something, a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that, and it all goes in there, and then at the end of the day, you have a good soup. Uh, that, that's, that's the process. It's creative. It's, it's a little bit uh, uh, happenstance. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a little bit, you know, somebody told me the other day, I, I, read, I read somewhere, that there's a very, very, very thin line between creativity and disobedience. You know, you're going against the status quo. You're putting it together in a way that makes sense to you, that maybe people can't see when you're in the middle of the process, but at the end it comes out. The only way I, I, I can describe it, and I, until the end of the day, until when the people come in and I can see in their eyes their reaction to it, I don't know. I don't know the answer until that, then I know it's a hit. It's interesting what you say about creativity and obedience, because as you're talking, I've been just thinking about all the people who've copied you, right? I mean, people, I mean, you're probably one of the most copied people out there because you invented this whole category and it's been, ex I mean, we've all been in that wannabe cool hotel. They're like, well, if we have dim lighting and some pulsating music and, you know, a couple of other elements and like a, 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 a snappy uniform on an attractive person, like we, then we're going to have a great hotel here. And, and it doesn't work because there's no disobedience. You're being obedient by being a follower. Right. And yeah. so, <laughs> so yeah. I, I really like that. And I think, you know, for those of us who are listening, it's like, I, there's nothing wrong with like you, you, you're a curious person. You, you travel the world, you, you're, you're, you're observing what's going on around you. And then for, you're able to make better decisions about what you actually do, but you're not wholesale copying people. You're just integrating the things that you learn as you travel around. Is that, is that a fair way to describe your process? Yes, it is. Everybody stands on somebody else's shoulders. It's like trying to figure out who started a dance. It's impossible. It's, it's or a song. It kind of uh, e evolves, uh, but you have to put your signature on it. You have to put your mark on it. You have to put all these elements, this body elements together and take it to some place that it hasn't been. Uh, and uh, 
that that's what the you know what the process is you know um the the only thing you know people know the difference between the coca cola and the royal crown cola they know the difference so if you don't have a vision if you don't have an idea that you're trying to execute that something new and something specific with something in mind, a certain attitude, then then the way you explained it, which I love it, you know, it's a, you're not being disobedient, you're being obedient. It's like then you're like a replicating something you've seen. Uh, it's not the real thing, and people know it, uh, you know. And uh, and so if they didn't know it, I kill myself because you like to think you're making this effort. The whole people appreciate the effort you're making because it's not meant to be what other what that what else is out there. It's meant to be something distinctive from that, and people do get it. Yeah, they do. I, I think they do. You know, we always assume people are you know people are way more savvy than than they're given credit for, right? And they can smell a rat Absolutely. whenever they see it. That's for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you obviously we talked about this earlier. Um, social media wasn't around when you started your career, but it is now, it's a big part of the world. And obviously in marketing, it's, it's a big part of, of, of presenting brands and selling things. And you have a, a pretty awesome Instagram that, you know, Ian Trigger, and we'll give that at the end. But, and I noticed all my cool friends are following you, including some former guests of this show, like Bronson Van Wyk, who's way cooler than anybody I know. And so I'm just curious, like, What's your view on social media? Do you think it's helpful? Do you think it's just like a, a waste of time? Like, how do you think about it in, in the context of your life? Well, the jury is still out on that. I have to say, I'm beginning to think more and more it's a little bit like a Frankenstein monster mm-hmm. uh, that uh, kind of uh, gets up and and, uh, and tries to destroy its creator. You know, the whole idea is uh, I like Instagram only because it's like a magazine for mm-hmm. me. I get to see everything that's going on all around the world. I don't have to get out of my chair or in my living room. I look at it. I see new things that are happening, and I get plenty of ideas or impulses for ideas from it. The thing that troubles me about it uh, is that instead of the technology giving us more free time, it's giving us less free time. We are more harried. We are more hassled. Uh, it hasn't done what it was expected to do. It's taken time away from us uh, rather than giving us more time. And I'm beginning to see a backlash against it. I'm beginning to see where a lot of cool brands uh, are getting closing their Instagram accounts. Uh, they don't want anything to do with it anymore. That's uh, See, that's the kind of thing about connecting the dots. Uh, when you see some of the cool fashion brands... Um, uh, like Balenciaga, uh, cool brand, uh, c- closing up their Instagram, you got to ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Is that the beginning of something? What does that mean? Is there a backlash against the social media? And I think it may be happening. Where it goes, I'm not sure yet. But I sense there's a backlash against it. I'm meeting more and more people that are not on Instagram anymore after the, the dramatic trajectory it started with. Uh, and, uh, you know, because I think it's it's not adding to the quality of our life. It's taking away from it. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely a double-edged sword. I'm curious. You mentioned that we, we spend more time on these screens and that it's, you know, it's 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 stressful. How do you make time for creative ideas? Like, do you do you have a way that you just sort of, is this just something that's natural to you? Or do you like make time in your day for like free thinking to come up with the, the big ideas that you that you execute on? You know, I haven't gotten that point yet to make free time in the day for thinking. I should, you know, Jeff Bezos, all these other guys, you know, they have very, very disciplined schedules. Uh, you know, when they, they have free time in order to do that. I, I don't do it like that. You know, I, I get an idea and I write it down. I get an idea if I don't have a pen, then I email it to myself. Uh, so I, I, I have it. You know, the ideas come from everywhere, mostly from the street. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm ju- I think it, the curiosity and the fact that I love what I do. What I do is not work for me. I love it. It's not about money. It's about the way I express myself and... And because I, I, I suspect I'm good at it because I do love it. Uh, and I still do it because I love it. Uh, and um, 
you know, I'm inspired by many things every single day um, from everywhere, from the most unlikely of sources, uh, from my 10 year old son. Uh, you know, uh, I get I get an inspiration or an impulse from an idea from everything. FOMO. FOMO. Now, one good thing about Instagram is that I posted you were coming on the show and a couple of listeners wrote in with questions for you. So I want to ask you, I have two questions from listeners. The first is from Farhad Farman Farmayan, and he asks, how are you so humble after all your success? And he wrote that to me to ask you that question. And I responded and I said, I didn't know you. And I said, is he humble? You know, I don't, I don't know him. And now I've met you and I can tell that you really are. And then Far, uh, Farhad said back to me, you could learn something from him on humility. So thanks Farhad for the insult. But I do like the question, which is how do you stay humble after, I mean, all the hits that you've had? You know, I happen to think that the real people, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that all the really, really good ones have a modesty about themselves because they know how frail uh, and 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 how quickly uh, an idea can disappear. Uh, and so you can't be certain of it. So that modesty, I think, comes with the territory. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, a really, really smart person is not afraid to ask a dumb question because he knows he's not dumb. You know, it's the dumb people that are afraid to ask the dumb question because they're afraid they might reveal who they really are. But I, I, I think because I'm not certain of the success of any project, and any time I step up, you know, I'm starting all over again to do it. And so, uh, you know, I just think that that modesty uh, is a uh, is, is 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 a virtue uh, because uh, you don't get complacent. You don't get certain and overconfident, and every time you do something, you you uh, uh, have to prove yourself again. You know, even a guy like uh, uh, like Steve Jobs, uh, who uh, you, know, uh, you know, the two people that I admire so so much are Walt Disney and Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, in a way, uh, uh, Walt Disney because he did so many things in so many different areas. Uh, where, where, where Steve Jobs did it only in technology, and, and, and Steve Jobs had, uh, you know, uh, maybe a personality issue. Uh, but I bet you they were all modest, and they were all not certain what they were going to be doing, uh, if it was going to be successful. And, but that's part of what drives them. It's interesting. You say those two examples, and I was thinking they both also create places where you want to be. Like going to an Apple store is is for some people is just as good as going to a Disney property or going to one of your hotels. And I think if you're not humble, then you don't you forget who the end consumer is because you you know you can't really like if you're building a hotel for people that you want to democratize that experience and you're so out of touch that you don't even know what those people want, like how can you even do that? So it's just an interesting thing to think about. I totally agree with you about the Apple stores, but you know, even more than that is I remember Bill Gates uh talking uh uh, uh, very d- dismissive about uh, uh, Steve Jobs building those stores. Uh, he thought he was building uh, 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 palaces to themselves and stuff like that. No, but he saw that there was an idea of a direct to consumer because he understood what consumers wanted. And I thought those stores were absolutely, a- absolutely brilliant. And then the guy who ran those stores for him got a lot of the credit for it and then worked at another big company and fell flat on his face because it was Steve Jobs was the driving force behind that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought that was a brilliant idea. And I bet you he's just as uh, intrinsically um, a modest guy that's just not sure of what, uh, even though he's a marketing genius, but he's just not sure of what he's doing every time. He got to prove himself every time, especially after the shot he took when he got fired. It's true. Well, we look at the, the Apple stores versus the Microsoft stores, and we know who won that one. So that's uh, one for Steve and zero for Bill. Uh, the other question I have is from Jeffrey Madoff. And he he mentioned, uh, he had met you at some point at a dinner and said that one of the things he he learned from you is that when you build the staff at your hotels, it's almost like you're casting for a film because you're creating a you're creating a, an ambiance, an environment. And so there is like this element of, you know, part of you're, you're building a world and, and so you have to be really smart about 
integrating people in. And you've integrated a lot of the entertainment aspects that you had from your sort of nightclub days. How is the way that you think about the entertainment aspects of hospitality evolved over the years? Every single thing at the hotel, every single thing is has to be on brand. Uh, 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 you know, you have a message. Everything, the claim check to your baggage, everything has to be signifying to the guest and set up a certain level of expectation. It doesn't start here and end there. It's everywhere. And so um, we are fanatic about that because we never know what's important, as I said. You know, when movies... They try and pick stars and starlets that have a certain look. Uh, we we try to do that same thing. Uh, uh, you know, that is not a politically correct thing to do today. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of, it's difficult. But, but everything at the hotel, everything, from the glass you drink your water from, from the straw you use, Everything has to be part of that world. Everything has to reinforce what the brand is about. Uh, and if you don't do that, then you don't have this really laser-focused, razor-sharp brand that people always understand what you're trying to do. Uh, the, 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 the outlets we do has to evolve with the fashion. Uh, they, 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 they basically stay the same, but... You know, and they have to be responsive to business ideas. Uh, like, uh, you know, I think the restaurant business is under siege uh, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, the payroll and, and and all the extra added costs. So I think that that business uh, may be looking back at an old idea like the the um, uh, automat, uh, the cafeteria, uh, the self serve. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean it has to be, again, dumbed down. Uh, you can have that with a gourmet chef. Uh, but but I think that's the future for food. And figuring that out uh, is interesting for me. Uh, I think uh, nightclubs are a little bit different because uh, uh, I think people people want more of it. They, they, they want more than just sweaty dancing. You know, they want like multimedia. They, they want to be stimulated in various ways. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it's it's a much more of a theatrical thing now. Performances, lectures, uh, product launches, films. It's just a, it's a really multi-sensory uh, kind of business now. It's just, it's just not so simple uh, than the way it was before. Uh, I think uh, bars, uh, they all have to have different personalities. It's not about uh, the design is different. Uh, it's about going into a different mood. You go to a place because it's different. And that applies to multiple bars in a hotel. You know, you, one bar does this, one bar does that, and one bar does this. Uh, you can visit all three of them a night, or you can visit one for the whole night, but they're different. They're different things. They're delivering on different uh, experiences. And I think... Uh, you know, that's the secret. That's what I would want to do. You know, I don't go out dancing at nightclubs anymore, but I feel that, that this is where nightclubs have to go. That's the future. You, uh, you hear to hear first. And I, and I, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. So I think we all have a lot to think about, about creativity and about I don't know, finding good ideas. So I want to thank you so much, Ian. You can find Ian on Instagram at Ian Schrager. And it's it's very nice, I'll tell you. It's the good side of Instagram. <laughs> and I just want to thank you so much for being here, Ian. I to thank you very much, my friend. It was very, it was a joy, but he asked a lot of good questions. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music FOMO. is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. FOMO. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact FOMO. at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.